Okay, testing, testing. Hello. Uh, I'm just going to do a sound test. Hands in your ears in case it's too loud. Go. Oh, it's not too loud. In fact, it's... Oh, I like playing exciting music. Uh, only I can hear it normally. So it's just... <gasps> um, so, hi everyone. Sorry that took a little while uh, to set up. We had, um, when we got here, we discovered we had uh, not got the radio. Well, let's be honest here. When I say we, <laughs> I'd left the radio mic in my office. And also we discovered our batteries were missing. We have a large pile of emergency batteries we put in every week. We put a fresh battery in uh, and we have emergency batteries and they were missing. And this illustrates, oh, I see, hang on, I'll get you. This illustrates a really important point, which is when you've got a really tight thing like this, like we're in here before the lecture starts setting up and we've got this schedule and there's three minutes to plug in this camera and two minutes to do that. And we're running really tight and everything's really tight. And if it all works perfectly, then everything's ready on time. When you set up a situation like that, what's going to happen? Murphy's Law, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we call it in computing, we call it the adversary. We imagine there's this person called the adversary who's out to get us. And the adversary is very powerful. In fact, adversary models of computation are different theories about how powerful the adversary is. So let's, for the moment, just assume the adversary is all powerful. We assume the adversary is out to get us. The adversary can't change your program, and the adversary can't you know, change the laws of physics, but more or less anything else than that the adversary can do. So if there's a combination of unfortunate events, which could happen, which would be catastrophic, you can be sure it will happen. So for example, when it's time to submit your assignment, suppose you leave it till, um, suppose you leave it till uh, one minute before the due date, and you think, oh, I'll, I'll submit it with one minute to go. Phew, I just made it. What's going to happen? Yeah, it's not going to work. Something's going to happen. The server will be too busy or something like that. Suppose you wait till Tuesday morning before putting up the final version of the Tude exercises. What's going to happen? Yeah, a truck driving down the street's going to pull out the Optus cable. <laughs> you're going to get to the library and you're going to owe overdue fines on your card and you won't be able to use the library internet. Your car will be being serviced so you can't drive to uni. The Optus people, the, you'll have lost your phone book and the only way you can get a phone number for Optus is by going on the internet. You can be sure these sorts of things will happen because they happen all the time. So basically, with computing, we have to build in all these safeguards. In fact, a friend of mine who used to teach uh, um, people how to be sysadmins, and sysadmins are the people that administer computer systems. He used to teach them at a college, and he'd say, uh, when the major assignment was due, like the day or two before it was due, he'd just go downstairs to the server room and just pull out the PowerPoint. <laughs> And he'd laugh when he told me this. And he said, this teaches them to keep backups. Uh, and it's true. As, I mean, although it was diabolical and evil and nasty, it's sort of true. Because when you're a sysadmin, that's what's going to happen. Just before some critical thing is about to happen, you will have a power out. And if you didn't do a backup because you were too busy, you're dead. Anyone that's doing their assignment on a laptop, your laptop will be stolen the day before the assignment's due. <laughs> If you're too busy to make a backup, your little brother's going to pull Coca-Cola inside the machine just before. It, it will happen. These, OK, so basically, when we deal with complex systems that we want to be reliable, we have to build all sorts of safeguards in. So just be prepared, that the, be aware that the adversary is out there and he's going to get you. And we call designing a good program so that the adversary can't catch it. We call that uh, designing against an adversary. And that's what we'll be doing in this course. OK, let me just write. Uh, I've just got some music I want to play later on, but let's now jump to the lecture itself. Oh, we don't want that. And we don't want that. We want this. Now, I hope everyone's been looking at task one. Of course, the final version hasn't come out. It's just a draft. But I hope everyone's looking at it and thinking about it. And I hope no one's thinking, oh, I'll wait a bit. It's not due for a while. I'll, I'll look at that in a couple of weeks' time. Because that, that's not the right thing to do. You should be looking at it now and thinking about it, even though, of course, you're stuck. I've noticed the vodcasts are live now. And also, um, just this morning, uh, we got the YouTube thing working too. So I'll post a link for that soon too. So you can see um, the lectures on YouTube at a much crappier resolution. So we might have to uh, 
uh, fool around with that too. What's that? Oh, you can't see because of the lights. Thank you very much for telling me that. And let's do this other trick that we sometimes do. How's that? Cool. And I'll make the font a bit bigger for you as well. Just flustered because of such the rush this morning. I used to have a rule when I played chess. I used to play chess a lot when I was a little kid. Hey, guys. Shh, 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 shh. Um, when I uh, was a kid, I used to play chess a lot. And I used to have this rule that if I made a dumb move in chess, what, what should I do? Resign. Resign. <laughs> <laughs> That's, you're not going to get very far in this computing program. <laughs> Don't pull on your sword. No way. Whenever I made a dumb move in chess, uh, um, you never give up. Never give up. Okay. Never. Never. We can't give up. If anyone here is ever contemplating giving up, quickly change that thought. Because giving up, that's, that's not going to lead to happiness in the computing world. Because you will always hit obstacles. I think if it's a fairy tale, there are three of them. No, two obstacles and the third time it works or something. So expect at least two obstacles every time you do something. Uh, if, you lose, if I made a dumb move in a game of chess, my rule was I had to sit on my hands. And I wasn't allowed to make my next move for a minute. Because I would find that every dumb move I made would always be followed quickly by another really dumb move, even dumber sometimes, because I was so flustered by the first dumb move. So I quickly learned, do something dumb, just, just take a moment and relax. So probably it's the same. Whenever you're stressed, take a bit of time. So uh, I'm just taking a bit of time now. We're all set up. Everything's cool. And I'm going to go font. Is, how big is that font? People at the back, is that big enough to read? Yep, OK. Uh, let's go to the schedule. Let's, uh, oh, I'm in Internet Explorer, see? Uh, I'm using Microsoft Internet Explorer. That's how flustered I was. <laughs> I'm really sorry about that. Yeah. We'll fix that up. Use Opera. Use Opera, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah use whatever you want. You can, you can use what you want. I don't mind what you use. Uh, I'm going to use Firefox at the moment. Uh, and let's make that font a bit bigger. You. One. Did that get smaller? <laughs> One, two. There we go. Oh, what a low, slow, lazy start we've got today. Um, design with functions, that's what we're doing. Week two. I had a look at the notes that the people writing on the nice notes page. Whoever's doing that, that's really good. Well done. I haven't checked out the raw notes yet, but the nice notes page looks fantastic. So it's possibly the same people doing both. It's just really good. Who did it? Wave, wave your hand if you're one of the people that did it. It was you? Yeah, well done. Cool. Anyone else have a, have a whack at editing on the page? Well done, well done. Anyone else? Yes, yes, okay. There's a whole, oh, and yes, okay, cool. Oh, no, no I think he was just gesturing at me. <laughs> and talking to his neighbor. Hey, shh, wait, wait. <laughs> You're in. Okay, here we go. Um, lecture one, let's just go to Richard's notes, not as nice as these Knight's notes. And let's look what we're going to do. So we didn't finish not a note, not a course on C. We'll get to that tomorrow. So first of all, I just wanted to make a brief announcement. Most of you will know, but the 8918 microprocessor has been released. It looks like this. Notice, very nice, 8918. Um, it's exactly the same. There's a little bit of blurb about it here you should read. It's exactly the same as the uh, 4719, 4917, sorry, that we were using last week except it's been expanded to be an 8-bit machine. Now with 8 bits, how many numbers can we store? How many combinations are there with 8 bits? Each one can be on or off. If you've got 8 things that could be on or off, how many combinations have you got? 256. Yeah, your first bit can store either a 1 or a 0, so it can store two states. For each of those states, the second bit can store a 1 or a 0, so that gives you four states. For each of those states, the third bit can store a 1 or a 0, so that gives you eight combinations in total all. Uh, for every one of those, it keeps doubling. So we go uh, 2, if we've got 1 bit, 4, 8, 16. That's what we had before. A 4-bit machine could represent 16 numbers. 32, 64, 128, 256. So we can represent numbers up to 256. We can't represent the number 256 because instead we're choosing to represent the number 0 because we're going to start from 0. So we go 0 up to 255. So that's cool. So now we can store bigger numbers. We thought that lets us have bigger addresses. Some of the instructions um, say, talk about an address. So load in whatever's stored at this address into register 1. Now when we're talking about addresses, we can specify a number between 0 and 255. So we thought, let's have more memory now, because we can address more memory. So it's also got more memory. We've got two, 256 bytes of memory. It's got the same number of registers. 
Uh, it's got one more instruction. Notice now we could, in potential, have 256 instructions. But we've just increased it by one. We've now got 17 instructions. And the new instruction is something that was really frustrating everyone before that they couldn't do. If you wanted to print a letter out, you couldn't print it. You could only print numbers. That was really annoying. Now you can print letters. So there's a new instruction, instruction number 24, that will print out a letter. How it works, this is the instruction down here. It's a two-byte instruction. The second byte, so the first byte will be, first number will be 24. The next cell will contain a number. Say it contained the number 50. And your computer looks up on a big chart called the ASCII table, looks up 50 and says, what letter does he want me to really print out? He doesn't want me to print 50. He wants me to print out a letter. Here's the ASCII chart here if you want to look at it. It's a famous chart. He wants me to print out the number two. <laughs> oh, now that's a bit confusing because <laughs> it turns out now that 2450 is the same as 82. <laughs> In your tute, uh, we ask you how many possible programmings exist. Lots of those programs will be more or less the same. So, for example, any program that contained 2450 in it could probably, possibly, sometimes be replaced by a program that says 82. Sometimes it could, sometimes it couldn't. So there will be programs that are equivalent that behave the same even though they look different. Now, ASCII um, is a table that contains a standard mapping from numbers to characters, and it was what was used on the early computers. Not all of them. Some used another um, standard called EBCDIC or something weird like that. That was an IBM one. But ASCII is sort of one now, and is a commonly used um, uh, standard. Uh, and then, of course, to represent letters from other languages and things like that has become really important. So ASCII has been extended and extended and expanded, and we've got other standards now that but they all include ASCII as a base. So the first 256 numbers, or certainly at least the first 128 numbers, uh, oh, we haven't put in 127 here, so the first 127 numbers um, are more or less the same on all systems. Okay, so that's in there. You can, you can look it up if you want. So that's the microprocessor. I challenge you to look at it and read it and think about it, because um, next week, hey, 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 shh, 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 okay, okay, oh, no, that's twice now. Oh, you're still talking. I, I used to play this trick. I had this theory that if I say shh to someone and I look away, I can go one, two, <laughs> you are ready for it, all that. So the trick is if I say shh, what I really mean is shh, not shh for two seconds. It's a little code. If I want to be shh for two seconds, what should I say? Shh for two seconds. Oh, I like your variable names. That's really good. Shh for two seconds, your function names. Okay. Um, look, I used to do it myself when I was in lectures, so I'm certainly not um, picking on you. It's just you happen to be the people I was looking at when I said it the first time. But everyone does it all the time. And the other thing is if I ever point at you like you, what are you supposed to do? <laughs> Look behind. It's really important you do that. Okay. So now you know about how to survive in lectures. Uh, okay, so we're going down. We've seen the microprocessor. Now I want to talk about something called side effects. I started talking about them last lecture. So, yes, sorry. Is the online emulator available for the 8918 process? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And we should all thank a man called Tim, who's up the back. Tim, do you want to just shout, hi? That's a Mr. Beep. Okay. I said shout hi, he shouts hello. <laughs> if I say print a beep, he prints a bing. He's, he's defiant and he's really, really good. He's written an awesome microprocessor and it's up and live and working. If there's any problems, post them in the forum and he'll fix them up straight away because he's like really good. Yes. So thank you, Tim. I should thank, thank you publicly. You've done an excellent job. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, what oh, what, oh, that's a good question. Uh, the question that someone asked, and I was hoping someone would ask that question. Why do we have instruction 0, instruction 1, instruction 2, instruction 3, instruction 4, instruction 5, instruction 6, instruction 7, instruction 8, instruction 9, instruction 10, instruction 11, instruction 12, instruction 13, instruction 14, instruction 15, instruction 24? <laughs> that is such a good question, and I, I'm really pleased you're thinking that question. So. <laughs> Can I leave it as a puzzle? <laughs> if you really don't get it, ask me in a couple of days, but give it a try and see if you can work it out. I can look it up on the internet, but we don't have internet in here, so. Yeah, look, it's a hard thing to look up on the internet. If you find it on the internet, post it on the forum. Post it on the forum. If I spot you're fine. But I'd like, I reckon you might be able to work it out yourself. You might not, it's a bit obscure, but I'm sort of claiming this is sort of probably what a real chip might do. Okay. So try and work it out, and if you don't get it, Speak, I promise, speak to me in two days and I'll tell you. Oh, send me an email and I'll privately tell you. Uh, so some people can work it out. That's an awesome question and I really hope someone's going to ask that question. Um, so a side effect is, um, well, does someone remember what a side effect is? We started talking about it. 
It's like singing. How is singing a side effect? Can you give us the full example? Oh, I asked for a cake. The, did the function give me a cake? Yes. Yeah. Did the function give me anything else? Singing. Physically? No, like physically. Let's pretend singing's a non-physical phenomenon. So, so the, the, he just gave me a cake, but along the way, something happened that wasn't really in the realm of things we were looking at. We were, we were really just talking about products and money. We weren't thinking about side effects. It's like, um, you say, I would like an Apple Mac, and you describe it really, really precisely, and someone gives you exactly something like that, but it smells as well. <laughs> and you go, but hang on, and they go, but you know, it, it meets all the specifications, it does everything we wanted to do, and you go, but also it smells, and they go, well, that's just nothing to do with what we were talking about. That's what a side effect is. It's something that's sort of out of the room of what you're talking about. So normally, with a function, you're really interested in saying what things you put into it, and what you get out of it. And sometimes the function does something else that affects the world. And that's called a side effect. Now, can anyone see, in all the opcodes we had before, which opcodes have side effects? No, don't, don't call them out. Just, uh, so a side effect is, in addition to affecting the flow and behavior of the program, it does something, yeah. 11 and 12. Oh. Um, I'm going to say, I can see why you're saying that, because they have an effect of moving something around, but I'll say that's actually an expected effect. In, as far as the microprocessor is concerned, I'm thinking that's just like a normal thing that would happen. So you could say microprocessors only address memory instructions, so anything that affects a register is a side effect. But let's say we expect our opcodes to um, affect the uh, registers and the memory location. So in other words, when this runs, I should be able to draw a little chart showing all the behaviors it could have for all possible numbers. What's something that sort of doesn't affect the behavior of the program? Yes. Seven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's sort of like not doing anything. As far as the program's concerned, as far as the person using the program's concerned, it's really interesting because I hear a bing. But as far as the program's concerned, or a beep, but as far as the program uh, is concerned itself, sort of nothing really happened then. No registers changed, no memory addresses changed, the instruction pattern skipped on one. It was sort of like doing nothing. So I could sort of say that's a side effect. Well done. There's one more. Print. Print. Yeah, yeah. Again, the instruction count, now the instruction pointer jumps on two. That's sort of the only effect it has. Other than that, it doesn't do anything from the computer's point of view, from the microprocessor's point of view. But now let's look at another point of view. From the user's point of view, which instructions do stuff? Seven, eight, and 24. The crazy thing is, when we deal with a, a computer, it's only the side effects that interest us, really. But from the computer's point of view, they're sort of irrelevant. Does that make sense? OK, so those instructions have side effects uh, uh, because they're sort of about how people interact with the computer rather than about how the computer does things itself. If the computer could monitor whether it was making a sound or not and do decisions based on that, then there wouldn't be, that wouldn't be a side effect only. You see that? It would actually be doing something. It would still have the side effect that we could hear it, which the, comp the computer doesn't care whether we hear it or not. Yeah, yeah. In other words, let me, a clearer way of saying it, if I unplugged the speaker, the program would run exactly the same way. No, but the behavior of the program wouldn't be different in one little bit as far as the computer was concerned. From inside the computer, it can't tell whether the speaker's plugged in or not. It makes no difference. It's like it's inside the matrix. It can't tell. A side effect is something that affects the outside the matrix thing. Or, okay, yeah. So now let's go down to uh, da -da 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 in C. A function that has uh, a side effect is printf. It takes in a message inside double quotes, which we're calling a string, even though we haven't really explained what a string is. So the function takes in this message, and what does it return? Nothing. If I said x equals printf hello, what value would be put in x? <coughs> nothing. It doesn't get hello. Hello gets printed on the screen. That's a side effect. And if the screen's unplugged, nothing happens, but the computer doesn't know. Printf doesn't return any value. I've got to double check that. Some C guru here. Does printf ever return a value? It does it? Can you see? Does anyone know the actual type signature for printf? No. It might. It's void? It is void. I think the tutors are saying it's void. Your one says it returns something? Yes. Okay, guys, you're going to have to have a fight after the lecture. <laughs> but 
Certainly, it could return something. It's absolutely completely plausible it could return something, and that would be an interesting design feature. But as far as we're concerned up until this point, it also could not return anything. It would be fine if it didn't return anything. As far as we're concerned, the only reason we're doing a printf is to get something displaying on the screen, and the program should run regardless of whether the screen's plugged in or not. You know, it shouldn't make any difference. We can't even tell that. So a function that doesn't return anything at all is called a void function. It returns void, we say. So we've got this sort of almost like a made up type called void that means nothing. So if I wanted to write the type signature for printf, which now I'm slightly nervous might not be the real one, let's call this Richard's printf. This is a Viking printf. But if I wanted to write my own printf, I'd say instead of it returning, it doesn't return an int, it returns nothing. And to tell C it returns nothing, I'd go void printf. And then in here I'd say a string somehow, whatever the type of a string is. I'd say it takes in a string. You haven't seen what a string looks like. Oh, I might have mentioned to you what it is. Does anyone remember what it is? Yeah, it looks like this, but we haven't seen it and you can't use it in the, in the assignment. Okay, yeah. So printf takes in a string, which at the moment we don't know about, and it puts, returns nothing, void, and all it does is has a side effect of printing on the screen. Now some instructions in C are void functions, which means they don't do anything, and they just have side effects. And some functions in C have a side effect and do something at the same time. And an example of that is plus plus. Plus plus uh, is an increment function. So it increases something by one. So if I said something like this, uh, int x, and then I said, so I'm, is this declaring it? Yes. Yeah. That's a semicolon, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then I said x equals six, now I've initialized it, given it a value. And now if I said x plus plus, And I wanted, to, and, and now I printed out what the result was. Ah. Is X a good variable name, by the way? No, it's terrible. Am I setting a good example by writing X on the board? No. Did I bring in the Mars bars today? No. What am I up to now? Four. Okay, it's, it's shameful. Did you know the story? Did I tell you the Marco Polo story? Marco Polo went, he went to like the King of China. He really impressed the King of China or the Emperor of China or Empress or whatever it was. Emperor of China was so impressed because Marco Polo taught the Empress or King or whatever it is chess. And the Empress or King or whatever said, Marco Polo, you're so impressed you can have anything you want. And Marco Polo said, well, what I'd like is a bit of rice because we don't have it back at home. And the King said, a bit of rice. And he said, yeah, a little bit of rice. And the King said, how much rice? And he said, well, I'd like one grain of rice on the first square of the chessboard. And can you put two grains of rice on the next square of the chessboard? And four grains of rice on the next square of the chessboard? And eight grains of rice on the next? And just keep going like that and give me that rice. And the king said, are you sure? That's like, like a bag of rice. You can have more. You can have like gold or something if you want. Chess is a good game. And Marco Polo said, no way. No, no. That's all I want. I just want that. And the king said, okay. So he, 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 does anyone know how big a chessboard is? Yeah, it's like got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And it goes down one, two, three, four, five, six, Seven, eight. This is not. This is like how a hacker would write a program. Just put it, and then I'll put little extension bits on. Maybe I should have designed it better up front. Uh, whoops. Okay, so we've sort of. <laughs> yeah. He always gave the king an advantage. <laughs> so, um, and he goes, okay, I'll have one grain, two grain, four grain, six grain. Uh, one, two, four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two, sixty-four, hundred twenty-eight, two fifty-six. Now, if 250, let's just get up to, uh, to 128. 120, we're going to get to big numbers soon, they don't mean anything. 128, how much is uh, 128 grams of rice? Not much. Not much. It's like, what, a handful? A handful. So, one handful, two handfuls, blah, 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 blah. 228 handfuls of rice. Now, if you've got handfuls of rice and you've got 128 of them, I reckon you could, like, fill up a small bag. What do you reckon? Like a two kilo bag, maybe? Maybe even more, like a five kilo bag. 128 handfuls? Let's say it's a five kilo bag. One five kilo bag, two five kilo bags, four five kilo bags, 128 five kilo bags. Good grief. That's like a pallet. 
Oh, sorry, one pallet. So now we've got two pallets, four pallets. Well, let's just say opposed one pallet, one pallet. We'll, we'll even skip some doublings. A pallet, two pallets, four pallets, blah, 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 128 pallets. That's like a shipping container. One shipping container, blah, blah, blah. 128 shipping containers, that's like a silo. One silo, 128 silos, that's like the output of a whole city. One city, 128 cities, that's like a whole province. 128 provinces, that's like all of China, all the rice in all of China. And if I'd got the doubling rice, uh, I've missed a few doublings in there as we went down. We, we get one doubling for every row I've missed. That's all of China in one year. That's all of China for 128 years. <laughs> Boy, was the king cross. Okay, so that's a doubling story. So look, I'm in trouble with the Mars bars. So far, only four, but it grows really quick. That wonder of binary numbers. So, so uh, this printf here, what's the value we're going to print out? Can anyone guess? Just guess. Seven. seven. Okay. Seven. The effect of x plus plus, it doesn't return a value. We're not assigning it to anything. We're not saying something like y equals x plus plus, though we could. We could assign it to something, but let's suppose it's not returning any value. It's just having a side effect. And the side effect is whenever C's does that, sees that, silently behind the scenes, it increases the value of x. Now, C has an unusual design feature that this not only has a side effect, but it also returns a value. What does this return? If I said y equals, suppose this here was y equals x plus plus, what value gets returned? Have a guess. Five, six, seven. They're all plausible, aren't they? It's actually six. This returns the value before it's increased. And see, even has this thing, you can say plus plus x. And that increases the value first and then returns it. So plus plus x would return seven x plus plus would return 6. Let's not even worry about that. So if you said something crazy like, what if you said this? x equals x plus plus. <laughs> x equals 6. Whoa. In this here, we're doing an assignment. So we're using the value it returns. And we're also making, we're also making use of the fact that it has a side effect, that it silently increases the value of x. After doing this, what's the value of x going to be? Uh, look, anyone that's saying any number with any confidence, you should look closely into your soul. <laughs> it's completely undefined. There's a plausible argument it could be 6, and there's a plausible argument it could be 7. Maybe this returns a value of x before it's increased, and then the x plus plus happens, and it increases x to be 7, so now x is 7. Or maybe it takes the value and stores it in a temporary spot, increases it, and then writes the value down after having increased it and moving it back down. We don't know. It's completely crazy and bad and weird. This is called a side effect. Side effects in programming are very dangerous. If you're a hackery sort, you can often squeeze, get rid of a few lines, because you're trying to do two things in one go here. You're trying to do an assignment, and you're also trying to increase the value of x. You think, oh, it's two things. Man, I'd rather just do them as one thing. And I think, that's not good. Do them as two things. They're two different things. So be very, very careful. I don't want you in this course to ever use side effects at the same time that you're using the basic effect. Either use it for its side effect or use it for the value it returns, but don't use both. There was a hand. Someone had a hand? Yeah. Um, yeah, printf returns a number of characters it's printed out. Printf does return a number. It tells you how many characters it's printed out. Cool, cool. So it's not actually void. But I was talking about printf. <laughs> but yes, thank you, Stephen. That's right. Yep. OK. Uh, so void, execution. Oh, yeah. So here's sort of how you could tell. If you could comment something out and it didn't make any difference to the execution, whatever it does must be a side effect. It doesn't always go the other way around. Some side effects would make a difference to execution if you commented them out. But certainly, if you could just comment a whole chunk out and everything would still happen, then it's just got to be doing side effects. It can't be doing anything real. And human versus computer point of view, I've already said that. The side effects are actually what humans are interested in. A language without side effects is beautiful and pure and completely useless. And a language with side effects is really hard to analyze logically. And it has all these crazy things that are happening outside the realm that we're analyzing. But those crazy things that happen outside the realm are precisely what we want programs to do. They print stuff out, move objects around, make sounds, make smells, all that sort of thing. OK. Now, we've done declare and define. Have we done that? Declare and define? Oh, no, we probably haven't. All right, let's write a program now. I want to write our own function. No, I want to have a break. Uh, does anyone have a question they want to ask me about task one? Yes. Oh, no, about something else. Have I been to Disneyland? I've, I've got two questions. Uh, um, so. 
<laughs> My shirt doesn't say anything about Disney. I don't, I don't think it says anything about Disney. Uh, because much as I love Disney Corporation, <laughs> um, I accidentally forgot to put their logo on today. Yeah, yeah. So Disney's really good. No, Disney's good. I didn't mean to make fun of Disney. Certainly, if this was ever going to be made into a movie and broadcast on the internet, you wouldn't want to make fun of Disney at all, because they're wonderful. We love Disney. They're the, they're the people behind the uh, Sonny Bono Copyright Extension Act, which extended the uh, intellectual property power of Disney and all other major, massive, multinational conglomerate intellectual property holders uh, out of the power of the Senate of the US. It's just really awesome. They're just compassionate and great. And all their movies are so good. You know, They take this really complex theme and they really simplify it. I really love that. It's really beautiful. Yeah, so, um, yes? Can you use void main? That's a good question. Let's go back to our main function. We say int main, and then we have those two arguments. And that's what all our programs look like. And that's the function that gets called by the operating system, the one that runs straight away. And someone said, can you put a void here? And later on, someone's going to ask, can we put a void in here? If you put a void in here, you're saying the main function isn't returning anything. So you don't need to say return zero. And it certainly looked, remember we just, for fun, return six as well? And if you fooled around with it, you could return any value you want. It doesn't seem to make any difference. It looks like the appendix. You think, why is that there? You can return anything. It has no function whatsoever. Why don't I just have a void main? Now, because early um, nasty sort of short cuttery, hackery sort of programmery type people when they were writing programs, never bothered to have in main return anything, even though technically it's supposed to. Um, uh, modern compilers uh, uh, usually set up that if you don't, if you if you just tell it you're returning void, the compiler will do the right thing and it'll magically change it if it's needed, or leave it returning a void, hoping the operating system will deal with it. And modern operating systems know there's so many people writing C code out there that don't return an int that uh, they'd better be well prepared to not get an int back. So somehow, some, if, you, if you drop the ball and don't do the right thing, either the compiler or the operating system is going to pick it up and you'll be safe. And so many people do it that you're probably not going to have any troubles. But what am I going to say? Can you put a void here? No. no. no because what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to return an int. If you're supposed to return an int, return an int. You might be able to get away with it if you don't return an int. Maybe. But that's not the world we want to live in as defensive computer programmers. You want to write a program that's correct, not a program that's wrong, but you're pretty sure someone else will cover up for it later on. That value returned is actually used by the operating system. The operating system should expect it to be there because the standard says it'll be there. If it's not there, what's the operating system going to do? Whatever it likes. What's that? Whatever it likes. Whatever it likes. It's allowed to do whatever it wants. I mean, maybe there's a bit of rubbish stored there. There's, it's expecting this function to return a number. It's set aside a little spot inside its most precious area and it's thinking, and when the function finishes, they'll put a number there. And that's your whole program, when it finishes, is summarized. Everything else your program does is a side effect. When your program finishes, the only thing that summarizes the behavior of the program is the number it returns. Everything else is a side effect. So the operating system, it doesn't know what you're doing. It just knows at the end, they're going to give me a number when they're finished. <laughs> you don't give it the number. The operating system, he's finished. I'm going to look in the precious spot and see what number he returned. Oh, 9,326,817 minus. Because that's, that's a random bit of rubbish that was sitting in there because it hasn't been initialized yet. Oh, that means he wants me to explode. <laughs> now, maybe, maybe that's the only dangerous number put in there. And all the other numbers the operating system is going to be completely happy with. But it's been told to explode if that number's ever been put there. And most of the time, if you're on your program, it'll be fine. And you'll ship it, and you'll show it to your boss, and your boss will be happy, and you'll test it in production for years and years, and you'll ship it, and one day it'll be in the challenger. And the challenger will be blasting off, and the random bit of number will say, ching, ching, apple, 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 apple. The random number's in there. It's the key one. Oh, goody, this is the operating system. I've been waiting for this for so long. <laughs> so you, you, you want to do the right thing, because you don't know what the consequences of doing the wrong things are. And you'll see when we get to um, 2911, so it's a fair way away, that when you write a program, it's sort of like entering into a contract. And programs tend to interact either with other programs or with the, um, the operating system. And you have a contract with them. And the contract is they guarantee certain things will happen. And you guarantee that if those things happen, you will do certain things. You must comply with that contract. Because if you don't, and you think they'll just pick up the slack, they might, 
but someone said whatever it wants. They're not compelled to. And a disaster could happen or maybe nothing will happen. So yeah, you'll see, on, if you go to a, I learned how to program on the internet page, someone will say, hey, I, I learned how to program, and, 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 and they'll write C code and there'll be void mains in it. And if you copy them and compile them, they'd probably work. Probably. And that's fine. But don't you ever post postcode like that. If it's returning an int, you return an int. And I shouldn't be secret about it. What does this number actually mean? Let me tell you what the int it returns means. It has a meaning. There's a reason for it. What's it for? It's an error code. It's called an exit code. When the program leaves, if there was anything that went wrong, the program summarizes that with a number that it puts in there that means something to the operating system. If everything worked OK and the program had no errors, it returns a 0. If it returns a non-zero, that means something went wrong in the program, and you're telling the operating system about it. And then different operating systems have different codes you can return to mean different things. So, so your operating system, you might be running your program, a C program, you compile it, it runs on Microsoft Windows, everything runs fine. That piece of code is ported over to Uni, runs on a Unix system. Someone in the Unix is interrogating the error code to see if the program ran correctly, and if it ran incorrectly, it I don't know, deletes it or runs it again or something, and your program will appear to run incorrectly. Maybe we're using the auto marking. Yeah? Maybe that's how we detect if your program crashes, because when it crashes, an error code will be written out. So we think, all right, anyone whose code crashes gets zero. Your code runs, but you don't, write it, you don't return an error code, so the random error code that was there is the one used. What's the chance at zero? Pretty low. So we think your program's crashed. So the auto marker goes, oh, their program crashed, and gives you zero. And then you come to me and you say, oh, it's just sad from now on. So we'll just stop the story there. Because it's sad now because I'll give in and I'll say, oh, it's okay, don't do it. And I'll be setting up all these bad habits and then you'll get to second year and, and then you'll say, oh, I had some problems with my code and they'll just laugh at you. <laughs> and you'll say, but Richard taught me to believe it's okay. If I make mistakes, he'll just cover for us. And they'll go, ha, 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 He's set you on the road to ruin. So let's start from the beginning and never, ever make mistakes. Let's just cover for everything. So that were really good questions. And that was our break, completely used up by those excellent questions. One last one. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Hang on. <laughs> um, uh, okay, all right. Uh, still getting some. Look, I think we need to hear some music, so I'm going to play some music about the assignment. Let me just flip to that. That'll be our real break. Uh, can you see uh, the song I wanted to play? Because the assignment, as you all know, is about Vikings. So I have some Viking music I wanted to play. Then why can't we see it? I am plugged in. And so is the computer. Oh, that's weird. That worked before. Let me try that again. Can you hear this? <laughs> that, that's not really it. That's not really Viking music. Here's the Viking music. Now, this is music that you might, I'm going to make it publicly available. You can also download it from the uh, web. It's by a, a Norwegian band called, uh, uh, I can't even pronounce their name, but uh, you'll be, I'll give you a link to it. You can download it. I think it might be nice music to listen to while you're programming. To sort of put you in the Viking frame of mind, and uh, and just sort of just it just I find it really spaces me out to listen to nice music while I'm programming. <laughs> so have a break for five minutes, listening to this beautiful music, and then we'll start again.